Uh, we'll talk about some of the lesser pests in soya beans and cover some of the few of the major pests in mung beans. Uh, this one here, cluster caterpillar, and you remember from before people might confuse it with heelys if they looked at the number of prolegs, but really the colour pattern on that is quite different. They're, they're much fatter than a heely and smoother without the hairs, yeah, and that colour pattern there is the dead giveaway. Uh, they will feed a bit on pods and they're called cluster caterpillars because the eggs are made in a furry mass and when they hatch you get zillions of little caterpillars in a cluster but as they get bigger they'll tend to separate out and you can see when they're small people often confuse them with heelys but they've got the even when they're small that characteristic black marks down the side and a little bit of a hump on the shoulder and smoother than a heely so heely will be a more parallel body these have got this little shump hump there they've been on steroids or whatever weightlifting and you can see the large ones much sort of fatter than a Healy. Loopers, they, there's a whole heap of species, uh, there's about three green species and about three or four brown ones, it really doesn't matter. All you need to know that they're loopers, it really doesn't matter I think if they're green or brown ones. But you can see there the pairs of prolegs, only two, some of the larger ones have three but then they're, they're not Healy's, they're much skinnier than a Healy or they like these ones here will taper towards the head so the rear end is quite fat but tapered towards the head when they're young these ones in particular the brown loopers are often very skinny like little bits of wire so they're common yes this all these different species really doesn't matter whether it's mochus or pantidia or whatever they're, they're leaf feeders and the moths are some quite pretty ones so I mean looper moth I'll mention that with that bright yellow very distinctive uh, and you've got the ordinary brown tobacco loopers and some of these bean loopers and sugar cane loopers but it really doesn't matter. They're, you look at those and they're quite different to a Healy. The damage, so that's uh, looper damage and the damage is a little bit more angular than Healy damage, that crop's been shredded so that would be of concern in a potting crop. You'd be losing uh, photosynthate ability. Uh, a lot of things attack loopers, so you get a lot of different types of parasitic wasps. Very common is to see uh, dead loopers with heaps of little fluffy parasites beside them, parasite cocoons. Or you might see some and they're just packed to the rafters with all these tiny little parasite cocoons inside. A predator that just loves loopers is the uh, spine predatory bug and that's the nymph and very distinctive with the bright ring of fire on the back there that's a warning often in nature anything red like that is a warning and for loopers that certainly would be a warning sign legume web spinner so yeah probably mostly cosmetic damage you'll see a bit of webbing in the leaves and the frass there frass is a polite word entomological word for poo soybean moth uh, it's a little beast uh, very tiny moth the larva feed inside the leaves initially and then web leaves together now sometimes you can get severe damage where every leaf will be killed. I've, on average and down our way it's about one every 20 years you see an event like that. Um, normally it's just cosmetic damage with a leaf rolled over and, and the little larva feeding is like you don't worry about that. So most times not an issue. Um, if you're growing mung beans this is what you don't want to see. So that's the telltale frass of the bean pod borer. So the little larva so that's it there, they're very distinctive moth. Uh, that's the larva feeding in the pods and often you'll get pods yeah, with these holes in the frass on the outside, very common in mung beans, navy beans, soybeans, it's not an issue. Initially the young larva will feed in flowers, so you need to well look for the distinctive moths, look for webbing of the flowers is the first sign. You need to control them before they get into the pods. Soybean aphids came in in the late 1900s was a massive problem in southeast Queensland and northern New South Wales. People did nothing at that stage, most crops were grown for green manure. Massive populations of ladybirds and, and hoverfly larvae eventuated and by and large the pest has been kept under control naturally. Uh, we've got a soft chemical to control it but most years we're relying on natural control and most years it's, it's worked. And soybean aphid, if you get a massive population you get sooty mould in the same way you do if you've got a very heavy whitefly infestation. But as I said, most years they're, they're there, but they're kept in control and you don't see that. And the predators, the key ones are the ladybirds, uh, larva with those distinctive orange bands, yellow bands across. Other important one are hoverflies. Um, wherever we've got a lot of aphids or whitefly nymphs, we see large numbers of these. And the larva is a maggot, will sometimes rear up 
on its rear end and sort of wave itself around looking for, for more aphids or whatever, so that's a distinguishing feature. No discernible sort of head capsule like a caterpillar has. Some of the important predators for things like the aphids are the uh, lacewings. Uh, and we mentioned this, we're onto lesser pests again, the uh, red shouldered leaf beetle, which just very sporadic outbreaks. A loosen crown borer comes into the plant in the early seedling stage, macerates the stem and lays its eggs in the stem. The larva hatches and that burrows up and down in the pith of the plant. When it gets close to harvest, it, it sort of ring barks the plant internally and uses that macerated tissue to plug that central pith and it pupates below there. And when you do that, of course, the plant either snaps off or it kills the plant above that. See, in the tropics, particularly in summer plantings, it's a bigger issue because it's hotter and they develop more quickly and they can kill the plant before you reach physiol maturity. So once your plants reach physiol maturity, it doesn't matter if the top of the plant dies, uh, so long as it's held up by fellow plants. So probably the best thing to guard against that is a reasonably uniform stand and, and not a thin stand. If you've got a thicker stand, the, the plants will support each other. But if you've got sparsely spaced plants that are very, each plant is very big, they get top heavy and they, over they go. Uh, and bean fly, for those of you growing mungs or navy beans, they lay their eggs in the leaf. And the telltale sign is, is a little spot. So you hold the leaf up to the light and you'll see the little pinpricks. The larva hatch, very tiny maggots, and they go down the petiole, then down the stem. And when they get to the lower stem, uh, they pupate. And by the time they've got to the lower stem, they're a bigger size and they destroy the vascular tissue and the plants die. And mirrored, they get into soya beans. Uh, we've done trials and we've had up to six a metre and no impact on yield. And because of the white fly risk in soya, we say, well, majority of crops, yeah, you, don't, you don't worry about it. And just be aware of what the nymphs look like. So they're a little bit sort of elongated in shape, uh, obviously without the wings and, and very long antenna. So in a crop, typically 80% of the population will be nymphs, so you need to be aware of what the nymphs look like. And that because the nymphs develop very quickly, it really doesn't matter if they're small or medium ones, within a very short period of time they will be adults, and equally as damaging as the adults.